Chapter Twenty of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Under Fire. The coroner sternly motioned Robert to his seat. Your testimony will come later, Lord Portstead. The Honorable Archibald Clavering is the next witness. Upon Robert's angry insistence that he be allowed to testify then and there, Lord Meldrum stepped forward and, taking him by the arm, forcibly drew him back. Meldrum then, with tender concern, assisted Lady Ursula from the stand. It was all done so naturally and so unobtrusively that the coroner gave him a glance of appreciation. When Mr. Clavering took the stand, he found himself in the most uncomfortable position he had ever before been placed in. There was but one idea clear in his head, and that was his determination to shield Meldrum at any cost, though he had little confidence in his ability to do so, especially when the coroner proceeded to trip him up in his simplest statements, and so contort them that he hardly knew what he had said. He judged from the furious glances that Robert directed at him that he was making a bad matter worse. Swiftly, the coroner turned the questioning into the channel he dreaded, and he looked in despair at Meldrum, as admission after admission was wrung from him. The coroner was bent upon proving that a violent quarrel had taken place in the library between Meldrum and the late Earl, with Lady Ursula as the cause, and Mr. Clavering realized that in spite of his best efforts, his testimony was only serving to implicate his friend. Burton apparently did not like the trend of affairs, and he passed another card to the coroner. That official read it with a shade of annoyance, and the inquiry was brought around again to Robert. In response to a direct question, Mr. Clavering reluctantly confessed that he had met the claims of Robert's most insistent creditors, and so saved him from arrest. "'At the present Lord Portstead's request?' asked the coroner. "'No,' said Mr. Clavering in his stiffest manner. "'At whose request, then?' Mr. Clavering looked regretfully at Lady Ursula. His innate chivalry revolted at the necessity of again introducing her name. At his sister's request, he finally admitted, when pressed. Here Burton was ready with another card. The coroner, angered at his officiousness, bade him remember who was in charge of the inquest. But nevertheless he asked the question upon the card. "'Has the present Lord Portstead, in your presence, or, to your knowledge, ever uttered threats or shown feelings of vindictiveness toward his deceased brother?' Mr. Clavering was dismayed at the question, and at a loss how to reply. His mind reviewed with painful clarity that dinner on Tuesday night when Robert had openly insulted his brother. Both words and manner had conveyed a threat. "'We are waiting, Mr. Clavering,' the coroner reminded him. He contrived to pull himself together. Something had to be said. "'The present Lord Portstead is of a, uh, impetuous nature,' he evaded. "'He may, in a moment of impatience, have been a little, uh, unguarded in his speech.' "'In short, then, you have heard him use violent speech of his brother, even to him?' Mr. Clavering, alarmed at the pitfall he was rushing into, made a desperate attempt to retreat. "'I am unwilling to state that his language was actually violent. I should term it, ah, uh, impetuous, such as any man in a moment of irritation might use.' "'You mean to imply, then, that the present Lord Portstead is of a highly impetuous but not vindictive nature?' "'Just that, just that,' Mr. Clavering assented with hasty relief." For some reason, the coroner was content to let this analysis of Robert's character stand. Mr. Clavering later saw why. "'Have you,' inquired the coroner slowly, "'ever heard any other person use violent, or shall we call it impetuous language to, or in regard to, the deceased?' This question put Mr. Clavering in great puzzlement. What was the coroner leading up to? "'I cannot recall that I have,' he finally said. The coroner's next question revealed his purpose. He was bringing the inquiry back to the starting point. "'You have stated that Lord Meldrum has been actively the deceased Earl's political opponent for a space of six years. In that time has he, in your presence, or, to your knowledge, uttered threats or shown vindictiveness toward the deceased?' There was a tense silence in the hall. All felt that this question, so abruptly leading the inquiry back to its starting point, and that starting point, Lord Meldrum, was more or less in the nature of an accusation. Yet not a muscle in Meldrum's face or body moved 
as every eye turned toward him. He continued to gaze steadily and calmly at the coroner. But Mr. Clavering trembled with indignation and fear for his friend. "'I have known Lord Meldrum since he was a boy,' he replied with heat, "'and there is not a trace of vindictiveness in his nature.' The coroner favored him with an incredulous smile, and upon this dismissed him. Mr. Clavering resumed his seat with a sense of having utterly failed in his attempt to shield Meldrum. He had made numberless damaging admissions which, while in no way clearing Robert's name, had aroused suspicion against Meldrum, and even involved Lady Ursula as a possible accessory. "'Don't take it so hard, old man,' said Meldrum consolingly. "'You did your best.' Colonel Darrell and Sir Gerald Leslie were the next witnesses called, but their examinations were brief and revealed little of interest. Elsie Baring's testimony followed theirs and was drawn from her with difficulty and only by dint of persistent questioning. In her endeavors to shield Robert, she answered the coroner's searching queries regarding Meldrum in such a way as to increase the suspicion against him, and she admitted having accused him of complicity in the murder. Burton could not allow her to depart without an attempt to make her incriminate Robert, so by means of another card he forced from the frightened girl the admission that some time after midnight on Tuesday she had from her window seen approach the manor a man who might have been Robert Sylvester. Burton was at little pains to conceal his satisfaction, as Robert was called next. Lady Ursula turned a shade whiter, and Elsie Baring slipped her hand into hers. Robert's attitude was puzzling, a mixture of defiance, sullenness, and fear, in no way calculated to win him sympathy. The coroner wasted little time in preamble, but abruptly asked Robert if it were true that he had returned to the manor Tuesday after midnight. Yes, admitted Robert, with a scowl at Burton. Lady Ursula caught her breath sharply and cast an appealing glance at Robert, but he persistently looked away from her. "'What was the hour of your lordship's return?' pursued the coroner. "'I didn't consult my watch,' growled Robert. "'It might have been a little before two. "'You know as well as I do that it was,' asserted Robert surlily. The coroner plainly resented his manner, and his voice was harsh and peremptory as he asked, "'Why should you return at that hour? "'Had you not been practically ordered out of the house by your brother?' "'It was not the first time he had ordered me out,' said Robert bitterly. "'I came back because I needed money.' "'How did you enter the manor?' "'By the garden door into the library. It was open.' "'Who was in the library?' "'My brother.' "'Was he alone?' "'Yes.' "'Did he remain alone with you?' "'Yes,' sharply. "'You are sure?' "'I tell you he was alone with me and remained alone with me,' reiterated Robert with a dogged scowl. "'Then your sister, the Lady Ursula, was not in the library?' Robert turned upon him with a smothered oath. "'What are you trying to insinuate?' "'I must ask your lordship to keep your temper,' rebuked the coroner severely. "'If your sister was not in the library, where was she then?' "'How should I know? In bed and asleep, I suppose.' "'Did you apply to your brother for money?' "'Yes.' "'With what result?' "'The usual one. Not a shilling would he give me.' The coroner regarded Robert gravely. Did he not realize the bad impression he was creating by his ill-concealed bitterness toward his brother, or was he too desperate to care?' "'Then what happened?' the coroner asked. Robert's jaw dropped. "'What happened?' he echoed, casting a furtive glance at his sister. "'Nothing happened. I went away.' The coroner consulted his notes. "'Where were you, my lord, when the pistol shot occurred?' "'In—in in the gardens,' he said thickly. "'Not in the library?' suggested the coroner. Robert flung up his head with a defiant gesture. "'What's the use of my denying it? Nobody will believe me.' Lady Ursula rose as though in protest, but at a warning look from Robert she sat down again, her slender hands clenched together. The coroner opened a narrow box on the table in front of him and drew out a silver-mounted pistol. "'Is this your pistol?' he asked curtly. Robert's mouth quivered. The sweat drop stood out on his brow. "'It is my pistol.' His voice was hardly louder than a hoarse whisper. "'Very well, that will do,' said the coroner quietly. The next witness was a young man who proved to be a clerk from a well-known London ammunition store. Robert walked unsteadily to his seat beside his sister, and remained with face hidden in his hands during the whole of the young clerk's testimony, which consisted in proving that the bullet found in the deceased Earl's body had been discharged from a pistol 
of the size and make of Robert's. The cylinder, with its one empty chamber, was then shown to the jury. Elsie Baring slightly and involuntarily recoiled from Robert, but Lady Ursula slipped her hand within his arm, flashing a peculiarly bitter glance at Lord Meldrum. He responded by one that was reassuring and yet sad. Mr. Clavering felt decidedly nervous when he heard Mary Gray's name called next, but his fears became allayed as he found that she confined herself to the briefest and most evasive answers, and made no mention whatever of the particles of mud on the library floor, her excursion into the woods, nor even her acquaintance with Mavis Travers. He was both relieved and surprised that she should conceal these facts. He, too, had somehow succeeded in doing so. Indeed, she glossed over in every way the evidence against both Robert and Meldrum, to the very visible indignation of Burton, who had been besieging the coroner with cards from the moment she stepped upon the stand, flashing an elusive smile in his direction. She corroborated Mr. Clavering's by no means coherent story of the recovery of Lady Pevensey's necklace, the theft of which evidently appeared to the coroner the starting point of the mystery and crime which overhung the manor. Viewed in any aspect, the return of the necklace was unaccountable. Mary Gray said she should not presume to account for it, but stamped as absurd Burton's elaborate theory, revealed by the questions instigated by him, that Robert was the thief, and that he had lain concealed in the north wing from directly after the murder until a day or so later, and that then, owing to pressure brought to bear upon him, or difficulty in disposing of the necklace, had been induced to return it. "'Mr. Burton's theories are ingenious, and so interesting,' she said sweetly, but, with an expressive elevation of her eyebrows, quite impossible. This brought upon her a savage frown from Burton, and a stern reproof from the coroner, who informed her that she was there to state facts, and not to ridicule the logical theories of an experienced and official detective. She acknowledged her error with a maddening little smile, and then coolly went on to explode others of Burton's obviously apparent theories, without, however, advancing any of her own. The coroner, in despair, finally dismissed her. Not a single new fact had he succeeded in eliciting. Then was called the witness whose testimony Mr. Clavering dreaded above all else, the secretary, Harry Brooks. Mr. Clavering's fears had not been in vain this time. With little or no attempt to conceal his hatred of Lord Meldrum, Brooks dwelt in detail upon every incriminating fact against him, the deceased Earl's well-known objection to his attentions to Lady Ursula, the resultant coolness between the two men, bordering upon open hostility on the day of the murder, the late interview in the library, and Meldrum's presence in the gardens when the body was discovered. He further cited Meldrum's active opposition to the political measures that Portstead was drafting, and the disappearance of these papers following upon the murder. There was no doubt that the secretary's testimony made a profound impression upon coroner, jury, and spectators. He had proved that Meldrum had both incentive and opportunity. Mr. Clavering glanced apprehensively at Meldrum. He was regarding the malignant little secretary with the tolerance of good-natured contempt. Robert had raised his head and was staring at Brooks with bewilderment and indignation while Lady Ursula, with eyes aflame, seemed to be struggling with a desire to cry out her anger against him. Her attitude had for some time puzzled and distressed Mr. Clavering, and he was inclined to resent her coldness toward Meldrum. He felt that she owed at least loyalty to the man who loved her. Convinced as he was that she possessed secret knowledge of the murder, he thought that she was treating Meldrum with injustice and that her own conduct was hardly less suspicious than his in the light of what the inquest had brought forth. Yet now, at Brooks's accusations, she was impatient to defend Meldrum and denounce his accuser. Mr. Clavering acknowledged that the ways of women were inexplicable. And now Meldrum was called. As he came quietly forward in response to his name, tension in the hall ran high. There was much craning of necks and jostling one another to obtain a better view of the fair-haired, powerfully built, typically English man, stood up there in open court for the delectation, as it were, of the idle and the curious. Meldrum faced that sea of eyes, some mocking or contemptuous, others merely inquisitive, a few compassionate, and some even horrified, not with defiance or a palpably studied indifference, 
but with a manly composure that won him a certain degree of respect and sympathy, even from that sensation-seeking, irresponsible crowd. But it is doubtful if, in those first few moments, he saw, or was even conscious, of any one in the hall, save Lady Ursula, on whose sorrowful, drawn face his calm gaze was fixed. The coroner opened the examination by inquiring whether Harry Brooks had exaggerated the importance of the missing government papers. Meldrum replied that, on the contrary, their disappearance must be a very grave loss to the late Earl's constituents. "'But a gain to your lordship's constituents?' pressed the coroner. "'I think I may say so, yes,' Meldrum replied slowly. "'A distinct gain.' This admission, or avowal, cost him sympathy, but though he was aware of it, his composure remained unshaken. The coroner was somewhat taken aback by his frankness, but, recovering himself, asked if the interview in the library had had to do with these papers. Meldrum replied that it had not. "'With what, then, did it have to do?' "'With matters of a private nature,' Meldrum answered, with evenness, but none the less with finality. The coroner recognized the uselessness of attempting to press the point. He knew enough of men to realize that under Meldrum's correct civility lay a substratum of indomitable reserve that no amount of cross-examining could break through. He leaned back in his chair a moment and made a rapid analysis of his uncompromising adversary for as adversaries he had come to regard those who stood before him in the witness-box. He saw, as others saw, the typical man of the English upper classes. Correct in bearing, faultless in appearance, his face high-bred and impassive. The hair, of that fairness of tint which shows gold in the highlights, neatly groomed, the clothes perfectly tailored, and the hands, though large and slightly bronzed from the open-air life Meldrum loved, shapely and carefully tended. But the coroner saw more than this. He saw the severity of the eyes, the rigidity of the mouth, a baffling and inscrutable purpose that he knew would never falter. He had an irresistible desire to fathom this purpose, the more because he was dimly certain that he would not be able to do so. Having measured his opponent, he returned again to the attack. "'Was your interview with the deceased Earl of an amicable character?' "'Of an indifferent character,' replied Meldrum, with unruffled placidity. "'You parted on friendly terms?' "'We parted with civility.' There was again a pause. The coroner closed his eyes and stroked his chin. He felt the steel reserve in Meldrum's polite tone. He tried now a deeper thrust, permitting his voice to appear harsh and his manner increasingly authoritative. "'Do you assert that you went directly into the gardens after the interview?' "'I do not assert it,' said Meldrum, to everybody's amazement. "'What do you mean by that?' demanded the coroner sharply. That baffling rigidity tightened about Meldrum's mouth. "'Simply that I do not assert it,' he responded with unalterable calm. The coroner leaned back in his chair in irritated perplexity. After a moment he sat forward quite fiercely, and again began his attack upon that steel composure. He thrust obliquely this time. How long after the interview was it before you went into the gardens? Lord Meldrum did not attempt to evade the thrust. I prefer not to state, he said straightforwardly and without emotion. Lady Ursula dropped her face in her hands with a smothered sob. Like Robert, she had broken beyond all conventional restraint and showed herself what she was, a soul-wrung creature. A gasp went round the hall, a wave of excitement, the indrawing of many breaths. Meldrum alone was quite unmoved. "'Lord Meldrum,' demanded the coroner trenchantly, "'do you realize the seriousness of your refusal to answer this question?' "'I think so,' still with that rigid calm. Mr. Clavering stifled a groan. Meldrum was bent on destroying himself. And for whom? There was a nameless dread at his heart. He glanced at Lady Ursula's blanched face. She was staring now at Meldrum with a pitiful intensity. "'Great heavens!' It could not be. A question of the coroner concerning Robert's pistol startled him from these broodings. Has the pistol marked with the name of Robert Sylvester ever been in your possession? Meldrum deliberated. There was a tense wait. From all those many people came not so much as a breath. Meldrum was plainly weighing his answer. At last, he said, in the same emotionless voice, It has been in my possession. At this, Robert's face showed utter bewilderment unbelief. 
Whisperings rose to loud murmurs, and a girl at the back of the hall giggled hysterically. "'Silence there!' cried the usher. The coroner was quick to press his point. If he could not shiver the steel, he yet might chip it. "'Was this pistol in your possession Tuesday night?' The poise of Meldrum's head grew more rigid, but there was no tremor of his lids or quiver of his mouth. "'I think,' he said steadily, "'that I am justified in refusing to answer.' That ended his examination. There was a commotion in the audience. Lady Ursula had fainted. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Gray Surprises Mr. Clavering. The coroner's jury brought in the verdict that Mr. Clavering had feared, and Lord Meldrum was held for trial. Robert was utterly astounded at the turn affairs had taken and showed more indignation over Meldrum's detention than relief at his own unexpected escape. Lady Ursula had been carried from the hall before the verdict was returned, and it devolved upon Mr. Clavering to inform her of it, Lady Pevensey having declared that her nerves were unequal to the strain, and Elsie Baring, in her joy at Robert's acquittal, taking no thought of any one else. It seemed to Mr. Clavering that most unpleasant things fell to his lot. Lady Ursula received the news of the indictment in exactly the way he had dreaded, and when she learned that Meldrum was already being taken to the jail in Westhaven, the nearest town to Portstead, her grief became frenzied and uncontrollable. It was only by promising to visit Meldrum that night and assure him of her love, but not faith, Mr. Clavering was pained to note, that he succeeded in getting her into the carriage. Robert showed scant sympathy with his sister's grief, did not even ride in the carriage with her, but returned to the manor on foot and alone. Mr. Clavering was puzzled and considerably exasperated by his conduct. The boy was a mystery, and he certainly possessed the faculty of alienating what few friends he had. Mr. Clavering was driven to Westhaven that evening, and after a good deal of difficulty gained admission to the miserable building that did duty as a jail. His distress was so great at finding Meldrum in a wretched little unplastered room, which contained but a single barred window, that the prisoner had to turn consoler and try to make him believe that he had never been in more comfortable quarters. "'You shall not pass many more nights in this unspeakable place,' said Mr. Clavering, actually with tears in his eyes. "'I'm going to clear you in spite of yourself.' "'Dear old chap,' responded Meldrum gratefully, "'don't take it so to heart.' "'I intend,' persisted Mr. Clavering, "'to unmask the murderer who is hiding behind your misplaced generosity.' The severity came again into Meldrum's eyes, and his mouth tightened. "'Clavering, I want you to let this matter rest.' I have practically admitted my guilt, and that must be an end of speculation. I am going to clear you, reiterated Mr. Clavering stubbornly, and I shall not depend on speculation. Meldrum gave an exasperated smile. You always were confoundedly obstinate, old man, but don't, if you want to win my appreciation, mix yourself up any further in this case. It's a bad one. I am perfectly comfortable here. I haven't a complaint against a soul. And now that you have brought me Ursula's message, I am happy, very happy. Old chap, he began earnestly, stand by her. Don't let the detectives worry her. Robert means well, but he's only a boy and weak. I will stand by her, Mr. Clavering promised, and I shall stand by you too, Meldrum. Meldrum gave his hand a strong, hearty grip. Dear old fellow, you are the best friend and the most troublesome that ever a man had. Mr. Clavering rode soberly back to the manor, where he passed an unpleasant and wakeful night. He could not get Meldrum in his miserable cell out of his thoughts, and toward midnight he heard vague sounds of stirring through the house. In the light of what had happened on former nights, he thought it advisable to get up and investigate. But by the time he had donned dressing-gown and slippers and stepped into the corridor, there was perfect silence over the old house. Deciding that his nerves had played him false, he returned to bed. Since the discovery of the secret passage, he had had a heavy oak wardrobe pushed in front of the entrance, so he had no fear of intruders. 
he slept fitfully until a little before dawn when he was roused by further sounds of stirring as vague and indefinite in location as the previous feeling sleepier then than he had felt all night he found it easy to persuade himself that it was the servants rising early and turning over continued his sleep until the sun awoke him with its brightness as was his custom he went down into the gardens for a short stroll before breakfast his old acquaintance the head gardener paused in his weeding as he approached great excitement in the village last night sir excitement echoed mr clavering with interest what happened david didn't you hear the pistol shot sir but no i suppose you wouldn't being up here so far away pistol shots mr clavering was quite agitated was it a uh, another murder david rose stiffly and painfully from his knees that's hard to tell sir nobody left to say you mean everybody concerned is dead gasped mr clavering don't rightly know sir said david laconically everybody's gone somehow cottage be empty eh now i think sir i believe tis the very one you was asking bout they calls it wild rose villa mr clavering waited to hear no more but set out for the village with speed and resolution it was not until he reached the lodge and saw through the open lattice the table spread with snowy cloth and tempting dishes that he remembered his forgotten breakfast he almost yielded and turned back but finally conquered the inner man and walked briskly down the hill without daring a backward glance along a branch of the road a grassy lane gay with bright hedge flowers he heard the soft quick thud of a horse's hoofs and presently a familiar chestnut mare and high yellow-wheeled dog-cart swung into view but instead of a pompous coachman in the portstead livery lady ursula was driving and she was alone without even a groom to attend her mr clavering waited until the mare came up to him and he fancied that lady ursula was somewhat disconcerted at seeing him in any case her greeting was not over cordial it seemed to him that she looked more worn and weary than she had the day before there was about her a certain tense anxiety a restless nerve energy but it was not to be wondered at she must have passed a sleepless night thinking of meldrum awaiting trial in west haven jail you are abroad early lady ursula mr clavering remarked trying to say something that should be impersonal and natural but he felt stiff and ill at ease under her questioning half irritated gaze somehow this remark displeased her he could feel her irritation was growing the morning air she said vaguely and the hand that held the whip tightened there's nothing like the morning air for a drive but come get in and i will take you back to the manor it must be breakfast time he thanked her but declined her invitation saying that he was on his way to the village to investigate david's story of a disturbance there that night lady ursula's eyes held a curious light and she snapped at the air with her whip which caused the mare to curvet she pulled her down sharply david is getting in his dotage if there had been any serious disturbance we should have been informed of it you had best let me drive you back you will miss breakfast upon his declining a second time she gave the mare a sharp cut of the whip and she flew up to the lodge gates with a dash and a vim worthy of a certain little shetland pony mr clavering stood staring helplessly after them for the life of him he had never had the courage to mention the name of mavis travers to lady ursula although he could have had no better opportunity to do so than now she must know that her brother's principal beneficiary was living in the village and she should know that the disturbance was said to have taken place at her cottage then why had he not told her he angrily asked himself unable to find an answer he hastened forward again pondering as he went why lady ursula who was a notoriously late riser should take such a very early drive and without coachman or groom could she have been to west haven in the hope of seeing meldrum it was hardly likely as she must then have started before dawn in order to be back by now but however it was why had her manner toward him been so curt and irritated well his stay at portstead manor had been on the whole very unpleasant and he thought with regretful longing of his quiet well-ordered chambers in mayfair were it not for his unfortunate he felt it now to be unfortunate interest in things criminal he might at this moment be reclining in gentlemanly ease in those decorously peaceful precincts instead of pushing onward hot dusty leg-weary and breakfastless toward another scene of violence 
Puck's reflection upon mortals appealed to him then as being peculiarly apt. But the drowsy little village, as he passed along its main street, gave no hint of harrowing excitement to be found there. Quaint, placid, sweet-scented as an old-world garden, it slumbered on in the deep blue haze of the summer day. Yet when he turned down the lane where Mavis Travers lived, he saw there a quickening, an excitement, and Wild Rose Villa was the scene of the awakening. The little garden was thronged with a curious crowd of country folk of both sexes and all ages, from the white-capped old grandam to the apple-cheeked toddler, and the roses rioting there were being ruthlessly trampled underfoot. At the flower-curtained window was now no elfish child face, framed in a flying mass of red hair, no formidable Elena in the porch doorway, but in their places round-eyed, excited rustics, all talking at once. In the tiny entry hall Mr. Clavering beheld a very fat, self-important village magistrate taking copious notes. Mr. Clavering, striving to hide his own agitation under a mask of impressive dignity, made his way toward this functionary, through a group of smock-frocked haymakers, who fell away in admiring wonder before this elegant gentleman with the silk hat and silver-topped cane. But before he could address the note-taking personage, a slim, girlish figure detached itself from a circle of substantial-looking village women and came toward him. He gave a gasp of astonishment. "'I knew you would come, Mr. Clavering,' smiled Mary Gray. "'May I ask,' he began, "'how you happened?' "'You may,' she interrupted, "'but please don't. "'You mustn't expect me to take the time now to explain. "'I want you to come out upon the porch. "'I have something to show you there.' Motioning back the women who would have followed, she led him out upon the porch and pointed to the door, which swung wide. A little above midway in the door were three round, blackened holes, slanting downward. She indicated where one bullet was embedded in the porch and another in a post supporting it. Some dark stains upon the flooring showed that one of the bullets, at least, had done execution. A chorus of awed exclamations in rude country speech burst forth anew as Mary Gray, with the business-like coolness which always characterized her at such times, pointed out to Mr. Clavering these evidences of violence. She was bombarded with questions by the greedily eager villagers, but she broke from them impatiently, and taking Mr. Clavering by the arm, drew him into the garden. "'Let us trace the course taken by the person with the bullet wound in the leg,' she said. "'That bullet traveled too low to have hit anything but a leg or a foot.' "'But Mavis and Elena, where are they?' demanded Mr. Clavering, as in his bewilderment he passively submitted to being led about by this authoritative young woman. "'Fled to parts unknown,' she shrugged. "'But which of them do you think was shot?' "'My dear Mr. Clavering,' she exclaimed with impatience, "'don't be stupid. Those shots were fired from the inside, presumably by our friend Elena, to keep out some unwelcome visitor. But come, these yokels are listening.' Mr. Clavering was beginning to have a certain respect for Mary Gray, so he forbore to rebuke her for the tone she had used toward him, and continued to follow her obediently through the riot of roses. He noticed that the pompous village magistrate, who had just issued into the garden, took off his hat to her with deference as he was about to pass through the gate, and he supposed she had given him to believe that she was one of the guests at the manor. The course taken by the wounded person was not difficult to trace. A trail of tramped-down roses, with here and there dark drops on the velvet of their petals or on the green of their leaves, led around to the back of a small, creeper-covered shed. There, in a tangle of high bushes, the wounded person had evidently lain hidden. "'He must have had a confederate,' observed Mary Gray. "'Wounded as he was, he could never have gotten away alone.' Mr. Clavering glanced in at the open door of the shed. In one corner was a roughly constructed stall strewn with hay, apparently the abode of the Shetland pony. But where was the pony? Mary Gray answered his unspoken question by informing him that, when a sufficiently long time had elapsed after the pistol shots to enable the Joneses to gather courage enough to come from under the bedclothes, they had heard the unmistakable sound of Tony's hoofs dashing down the lane. "'If Mavis and Elena went away in the pony cart, they should be easy to trace.' said Mr. Clavering. "'Suppose you trace them, then,' Mary Gray responded, with her provoking little smile. "'I am quite sure that they and the pony have parted company by now, 
and nobody in the village can account for their whereabouts. But perhaps you could discover. I think, said Mr. Clavering, resenting her manner, that the man with the wounded leg had better be traced first. If he is the man I think he is, he is a desperate character. What do you know about him? she asked quickly. Mr. Clavering felt that her circumspect testimony at the inquest entitled her to a little of his confidence, and moreover he believed that she, too, had investigated the cottage in the woods, so he told her of the man who had accosted Mavis and Elena, but said nothing of Meldrum's connection with him. "'Do you know who this man is?' she asked, watching his face curiously. "'He calls himself Thompson,' he answered, "'and he was Lady Ursula's butler for a few days.' He thought she seemed disappointed. "'It happens he is being traced by the police,' she said quietly. "'He is wanted on more than one charge.' "'Well, you have been in the woods,' asserted Mr. Clavering, "'and you must know where this man has been hiding. "'The constable should be sent there with an armed posse. "'Where is the constable?' he demanded excitedly. "'Now don't agitate yourself on such a warm day, Mr. Clavering,' "'she admonished in an exasperatingly soothing tone. "'I sent Burton with a band of villagers to that hut in the woods. "'Of course I knew the man wouldn't return there, "'but I thought that giving Burton something to do "'might work off his spleen against the coroner's jury.' for failing to indict Robert Sylvester. Mr. Clavering stared at her in indignant wonder. She presumed to address him, Archibald Clavering, as though he were an impatient boy. She had sent Burton. Mary Gray read aright his thoughts, and with her provoking little laugh handed him a card. Permit me to introduce myself properly, Mr. Clavering. In amazement he perused the engraving upon the bit of pasteboard. Mercedes Cuero, Private Detective. End of chapter 21
a copy of which Mr. Clavering also carried with him as a sort of cipher. One, Barnett Street, the borough, without a shilling, keep promise, come, will speak, please come, Rose. Rose, as Mr. Clavering remembered, was the name of Lady Ursula's missing maid, and he agreed with Mercedes Quero's theory that she must have written to Robert, asking his aid and threatening some disclosure. Mercedes Quero said that the mystery overhanging the manor had reached such a point that she did not think it advisable to leave the village for as long a time as it would be necessary in looking up the missing lady's maid, and she suggested that Mr. Clavering go in her stead. "'I have a pretty shrewd suspicion,' she observed, "'of what the disclosure is that Rose threatens, and I only want my theory verified. Otherwise I should feel obliged to go myself.' This remark had served to cool somewhat Mr. Clavering's elation at being chosen the coadjutor of Mercedes Quero, and he had responded, rather humbly for him, that he would endeavor to question the girl with all adroitness. "'And don't be too gentle with her,' the detective admonished. "'Women of this girl's stamp often will tell the truth only when frightened into it.' Mr. Clavering had assured her that he would leave no means untried to force the truth from the girl, and said that while he rejoiced at this letter— since it must be a factor in helping to prove Lord Meldrum's innocence, he deeply regretted that it must again bring suspicion upon Robert Sylvester. Mercedes Quero smilingly shook her head. "'I am not playing into Burton's hands, Mr. Clavering. You don't read between the lines.' "'But it is perfectly plain that this girl is threatening Robert with disclosure,' he asserted in surprise. A baffling expression came into Mercedes Quero's brown eyes. "'Are you sure it is Robert she is threatening?' He stared at her, astonished. "'Great heavens! Who, then?' She turned away with an impatient little shrug. "'That is for you to find out.' So it was that Mr. Clavering, with hope and fear in his heart, boarded the London train. Would Rose's testimony help to clear Lord Meldrum, or would it only serve to implicate him further? At Waterloo Station Mr. Clavering took a handsome cab. He had a deep-rooted mistrust of taxicabs, and was driven through the slums of Southwark, along by the narrow, muddy, and malodorous bankside. As he had always heretofore kept carefully within the confines of West End London, he felt himself lost in this wilderness of obscure byways and mean houses, and had it not been for the view across the river of the Dome of St. Paul's, he would not have believed himself in London at all. Barnett Street turned out to be a squalid little alley twisting off from the bankside. At house number one Mr. Clavering inquired in vain for the lady's maid. No girl answering the description of Rose Harris was known there. Mr. Clavering was in despair until he remembered that Mercedes Quero had suggested that the figure one might be only the last part of the number. He tried then House Eleven with no better success, and with a growing horror of the unsavory neighborhood he found himself in. He was some time making up his mind to inquire at number twenty-one, for this had a particularly foul and hangdog appearance, and the lower floor front was occupied by a dingy tobacconist's shop. Finally, he conquered his fastidiousness, and entering the shop where the fumes of stale tobacco smoke set him to coughing, he inquired for Rose Harris of the frowsy woman behind the counter. The woman eyed the immaculate gentleman distrustfully. "'What might ye want with Rose Harris? Mind, I don't say she's here.' Mr. Clavering recalled the instructions Mercedes Quero had given him for such a case as this. "'I know that Rose Harris is here,' he asserted firmly. "'She is expecting me.' "'Oh,' said the woman, her manner becoming respectful. "'So you're the gentleman she's looking for?' Fortunately, she had turned toward the door at the back of the little shop. Otherwise, Mr. Clavering's expression of mingled amazement and triumph would have betrayed him. "'You white ear, sir,' said the woman, as he prepared to follow her. "'I'll tell Rose you've come.' The woman was back in a few moments. Her manner now was profusely obsequious. She says if you go right up, sir, up them stairs, sir, second door from the ed. Mr. Clavering mounted the dirty stairs in a bewildered state of mind. What would Rose do when she found her visitor was not Robert Sylvester? While he stood deliberating at the top of the stairs, the second door was opened suddenly, and a flaxen-haired girl in a pink silk wrapper ran out into the hall. Oh, Mr. Thompson, she began joyfully, and then stopped short, dismay written on her pretty, insipid features. Mr. Clavering regained self-assurance in the face of the girl's confusion. "'I think you know who I am, Rose,' he said severely. "'Yes, sir,' looking all the time as though she wanted to run away. 
"'I have something of a private nature to say to you, Rose,' he went on, "'and this hall is hardly the place. "'There's my room, sir,' she faltered. "'A very wretched little room Mr. Clavering found it, bare and untidy. "'Rose swiftly and surreptitiously removed some clothing from the single chair "'before Mr. Clavering could sit down. "'She herself sat upon the carelessly made bed, "'swinging her little pink-slippered feet and trying not to look frightened.' "'Why did you run away, Rose?' was Mr. Clavering's opening question. The girl paled and then flushed. "'I've left service for good, sir,' with a toss of her pretty head. "'You have been given other employment?' he asked coldly. Rose bestowed an admiring glance upon the silver buckles adorning her slippers. "'I didn't want employment, sir,' she replied with a very disdainful air. "'Rose,' he said sternly, "'you must tell me the truth about the theft of Lady Pevensey's necklace.' The girl went white again. "'Why do you ask me, sir?' she whimpered. "'I wasn't her maid.' "'But you stole the necklace,' he asserted, obedient to the instructions given him by Mercedes Quero. She had bidden him waste no time in preliminaries, but come straight to the point by directly taxing the girl with the theft. Rose shivered at the directness of the attack and sat a moment silent. Then she flung up her head defiantly. "'I haven't got the necklace, sir. You can search every one of my belongings.' "'I am perfectly well aware that the necklace is not in your possession now,' he answered. "'But what I want to know, what the police want to know,' Rose shivered again, "'is the name of the man to whom you gave the necklace.' This, too, was at the instance of Mercedes Quero, who had briefly outlined the questions she wished put to Rose. The girl locked her little hands together. She recognized that denial of her share in the theft was useless. She took refuge again in defiance. "'I won't tell,' she declared." "'You do not need to,' retorted Mr. Clavering. "'The man to whom you gave the necklace is the man whom you expected would visit you today, Thompson, Lady Ursula's former butler.' Rose quivered, but she stubbornly pursed her pretty, pouting lips. "'I shan't never say it was.' "'What is this man to you, that you should steal for him?' demanded Mr. Clavering, resisting a desire to shake the little minx. A gleam of exultation shone in Rose's china-blue eyes. "'He is going to be my husband.' she announced, with an uptilt of her rounded chin. "'Nonsense,' said Mr. Clavering sharply. "'The man has been deceiving you.' "'He hasn't. He daren't.' But the girl was all a-tremble. "'If he meant to marry you, he would not leave you here in this miserable place without a shilling.' "'He will come soon,' she persisted, but the lines of her face grew pinched. "'He gave me his word. His word is a gentleman. He's not really a butler. He's a gentleman, just like you, sir,' she added with another flash of pride. "'He's a thief and a probable murderer,' objected Mr. Clavering with asperity, not in the least relishing this comparison of himself with Thompson. "'He didn't have nothing to do with the murder,' she flamed. "'It was Lord Meldrum. The papers say so.' "'The papers will soon tell another story,' said Mr. Clavering indignantly. "'But he didn't do it, sir,' she protested shrilly. "'If it wasn't Lord Meldrum, it, it must have been—' she broke off with quivering lip as though a sudden suspicion had come to her. "'It must have been whom?' demanded Mr. Clavering testily. Tears were very near the girl's eyes, but Mr. Clavering refused to be moved and sternly repeated his question. "'Well, then,' she cried desperately, "'it must have been Mr. Robert Sylvester.' Mr. Clavering's indignation was extreme. "'How dare you wantonly accuse Lord Portstead when you have just now written him for aid? Have you no shame, girl?' She began to cry dismally. "'I don't know who did the murder, no more than you do, and that's a truth, sir. "'But it wasn't him. It wasn't Mr. Thompson. He wasn't near the village then.' "'How do you know he wasn't?' Rose stopped crying and answered loftily. "'The very night I came here, he went to Lincolnshire to try and get back his ancestral estate that was took from him. "'He has been there ever since.' "'My poor child,' said Mr. Clavering, not unkindly, "'this rascal Thompson is deceiving you.' I know for a certainty that he has not only been in Portstead Village, but in the vicinity of the manor for the past nine days. This statement had an electrifying effect upon the girl. She sprang from the bed. Her whole face was changed, its soft prettiness gone, her pouting lips hard and set, and in her eyes almost a savage look. "'Does Lady Ursula know that?' she demanded. Mr. Clavering caught the girl by the arm, and now he shook her. "'Who is this, Thompson?' "'Ask her ladyship!' she cried wildly. "'Ask Lady Ursula!' End of chapter 22
Chapter Twenty Three of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mercedes Quero to the Four. Ask Lady Ursula. That was all Mr. Clavering could anger or frighten Rose into saying, nor would she account in any way for the return of the necklace. In fact, her surprise at learning that it had been returned appeared so genuine that he was forced to believe that she really knew nothing about it from the moment it had passed into Thompson's hands. She did, however, give a rather lame but apparently truthful explanation of how she had come to write to Robert Sylvester for aid. He was always a kind-spoken young gentleman, she said, and had sometimes taken notice of her. She was absolutely penniless and friendless in London. Thompson had not sent her his address, as he had promised to do, so she could not apply to him and owing to the circumstances under which she had left the manor, she dared not try for another position as lady's maid. In her difficulty, Robert Sylvester had suddenly occurred to her as a possible source of assistance. It seemed she had once approached him on the subject of getting her a place in the chorus of some musical piece, knowing that he had a wide acquaintance among the London music halls and variety theatres. He had promised to look her up a place, and then had promptly forgotten all about it. Rose, remembering his offer, had sought out his London lodgings, and, not finding him there, had written to him at the manor. Nothing more than this could Mr. Clavering wring from the girl, but the fact that she was possessed of intense bitterness toward Lady Ursula, for some cause at which she would only vaguely hint, and in which Thompson seemed to be unaccountably concerned, was very evident. It was clear, too, that her trust in Thompson was shattered, and that the disclosure which she had threatened in her letter to Robert referred to him, and would not be long delayed if he did not speedily fulfill his promise to her. Mr. Clavering finally left the girl, still in an excited and bitter mood, and re-entering the waiting hansom was driven at once to Waterloo Station. There he ate a leisurely lunch, as there was no train to Portstead for a couple of hours. Upon his arrival at the manor he was unable to find Mercedes Quero. He wished to consult with her before questioning Lady Ursula a proceeding from which he shrank, so he wandered through the gardens and park in search of her. He came at length to the pastures where the manor horses were grazing. From the group of thoroughbreds, outlined against the wide background of cool green meadow, frisked a pony, tossing his long white mane, kicking his little hoofs in the air, rearing on his haunches, and chortling in sheer mad glee. Mr. Clavering almost cried out in his astonishment. He knew that piebald, shaggy little Shetland pony, in answer to his call of Tony, the meddlesome little creature bounded up to the fence, and stood a moment regarding him with restless eyes glancing fire. But when Mr. Clavering put forth a cautious hand to stroke the velvety pink nose, the pony was off again in frolicsome mad flight. As Mercedes Quero did not return to the manor that afternoon or evening, Mr. Clavering was forced to keep this discovery to himself. He was very curious to know where the detective had gone, and her unexplained absence caused him to feel that she was on the verge of making a disclosure, and he dreaded it without knowing exactly why. He could not bring himself to question Lady Ursula in regard to Thompson, and he saw that she was as nervous over the detective's absence, her identity was now known to all, as he was himself. She seemed to be expecting some message, and to be unable even to attempt composure. Of Meldrum she spoke several times, feelingly, and with a certain pride. Indignation over his detention she showed none. Her attitude toward him made Mr. Clavering more apprehensive. If she could believe Meldrum guilty, it would be hard indeed to convince others of his innocence. He would have given much to be able to read this woman's heart and find out what she really believed and what she knew about her brother's murder. As it was, he could only wait until Mercedes Quero should return. Robert had spent the day in West Haven interviewing magistrates and lawyers in Meldred's behalf, and though he had met with utter failure in his attempt to release him, it was his intention to try again the next day. Robert was very bitter against the whole legal profession, and his warm advocacy of Meldrum raised Mr. Clavering's opinion of him, although his manner toward his sister was rather unsatisfactory. He was kind to her, and even at times affectionate but it seemed that he cherished some hidden resentment against her. 
Mr. Clavering would often catch him staring at her in a curious, frowning way. She appeared unconscious of this, and whenever she could free her mind from what was weighing on it, treated him as she always had, with a fond and doting affection, the unwisdom of which had helped to spoil him as much as had his father's and brother's harshness. To her he would always be Robin, the little brother to be petted and shielded. Robert spent the evening on the terrace with Elsie Baring, and Mr. Clavering, seeing them so happy and absorbed in each other, was seized with a pang of loneliness, and conquering the little hard feeling he cherished against Lady Pevensey, asked her to play piquet. Perhaps she was somewhat ashamed of the deception she had practiced on him. At any rate, she was extremely gracious and allowed him to win every rubber. In the flush of his victories, he found courage to ask her the question that he had long contemplated. She affected to be overcome by the suddenness of it, and protested that it was so unexpected that an answer at present was fairly impossible. Finally, when urged, she admitted, with much play of fan and eyes, that there was no one in the world whom she so honored and esteemed as she did Mr. Clavering. But, she said, she could not yet bear the thought of putting any one in dear Eustace's place. She did not offer to be a sister to him, but instead promised to set apart two nights a week for playing piquet. Mr. Clavering went up to his room rather forlornly, but an hour's reflection did much toward convincing him that possibly things were best as they were. If Lady Pevensey had chosen to marry him, he would have had to give up his treasured flat in Mayfair, probably the invaluable Jenkins, since Lady Pevensey and the valet cordially disliked each other, and, of course, his clubs, the deceased Eustace, had been obliged to. It was doubtless pleasanter to have a dictatorial woman like Lady Pevensey for a friend than for a wife. Consoled by this reflection, he summoned Jenkins to prepare him for bed, where he was soon asleep and dreaming of playing piquet with the deceased Eustace. The next morning, as he was coming from the breakfast-room, he heard the sound of wheels on the driveway, and hastening to the door saw Mercedes Quero alighting from a fly. She wore a travelling suit and carried a small bag. She looked tired. Her pallor was more noticeable than usual, her features a little drawn, but her eyes were positively brilliant, a sign that she had successfully followed up some clue. "'You have been to London?' demanded Mr. Clavering, after a brief greeting. "'I was there last night,' she answered in quick, incisive tones. "'So you couldn't trust me to question Rose?' he said disappointedly. "'I haven't been wasting my time on that silly little fool,' she said impatiently. "'Where is Lady Ursula? I must see her at once.' Mr. Clavering rang for a footman, who finally discovered that her ladyship was in the South Garden. On the way there, Mr. Clavering, who was bursting with the importance of the clue he had come upon, informed the detective— that he had seen Mavis's Shetland pony in the manor pastures. Pshaw, shrugged Mercedes Quero. I knew he was there before I went down to the village yesterday morning. Mr. Clavering was too crushed to ask how she knew, and he preserved an abashed silence until they caught sight of Lady Ursula among the roses, a shade hat upon her bright hair, and on her arm a garden basket filled with the flowers she had been gathering. When she saw at Mercedes Quero, an expression of unqualified terror flashed into her face. "'I am sorry that you have had difficulty in finding me,' she remarked, struggling to subdue her emotions. "'But I wanted to pick these flowers myself for—for for Lord Meldrum. I had intended driving to West Haven this morning.' "'You will not need to, Lady Ursula,' said Mercedes Quero gently. "'I have just come from West Haven. Lord Meldrum has been set free.' Mr. Clavering feared that Lady Ursula was again going to faint, but she recovered herself by a sheer force of will." "'Lord Meldrum freed,' she repeated in a dazed manner. "'What can that mean?' There was almost horror in her tone. Mr. Clavering viewed her with a righteous indignation. Here he was, simply a friend, hardly able to contain his joy at Meldrum's unexpected acquittal, while she, the woman on whom Meldrum had lavished the unselfish devotion of years, exhibited no emotion save dismay. "'It means,' answered Mercedes Quero in her quiet voice, that I have convinced the authorities that Lord Meldrum is not your brother's assassin. You know who is? Mercedes Quero looked pityingly at Lady Ursula's anguished face. Yes, I know. Lady Ursula shook, but she spoke no word. 
"'My lady,' said the detective very gently and sympathetically, "'do you feel able to take the eleven o'clock train to London? "'Sir Julian Travers is dying.' "'Sir Julian Travers!' Mr. Clavering echoed the name with almost a shout. How stupid he had been! It all came to him in a flash. Thompson, the butler, whose frowning visage had seemed so vaguely familiar, was Travers, the sporting baronet, whose spectacular crimes had driven him from England some fourteen years ago. He wondered now how he could have failed to recognize him, changed though he was by the passage of years. Lady Ursula showed no surprise at the name of Sir Julian Travers, but her face hardened and her mouth assumed a bitter curve. "'Is it necessary that I go?' "'He has asked for you.' Lady Ursula put her hands to her throat as if she choked. "'I will go,' she said with an effort. End of chapter 23「The Sporting Baronet On that hurried journey to London, Mr. Clavering rode in the compartment with Lady Ursula. "'You knew, Julian,' she said, "'and I must have someone go with me.' It was an unpleasant journey. Lady Ursula did not speak from the time she boarded the train but sat motionless in her corner of the compartment, glooming out over the flying landscape. She did not rouse herself until the deep, multitudinous roar of the monster city they were plunging into made itself heard above the noises of the train. "'London!' she exclaimed with sharply drawn breath. She was among the first to alight from the train, but Mercedes Quero was already waiting on the platform. She had ridden in the carriage behind. "'We had best take a taxicab she said to Lady Ursula, in a voice which had in it a ring of pity. "'We have some distance to go.' "'Very well,' responded Lady Ursula dully. "'We will take a taxicab.' Mercedes Quero, with business-like celerity, engaged the cab, Mr. Clavering appearing somewhat stupefied. In obedience to her injunction, the chauffeur made what speed he could amid the stream of traffic. At every halt, the detective visibly chafed. Suddenly, Lady Ursula spoke. "'Is he really dying?' "'Yes,' answered the detective gently. "'I am afraid we may be too late.' A shudder racked Lady Ursula. "'Is it the bullet wound?' "'Yes. Blood poisoning has developed rapidly from exposure and neglect.' "'He is not fit to die,' said Lady Ursula, a dry sob escaping her. "'But Elena should not be blamed. She was doing only what she believed her duty, protecting Mavis.' He would have taken the child away. He had tried before. Mr. Clavering was too bewildered by all that had happened, and all that he felt was still to happen, to remind Lady Ursula that only a few days before she had affected to disbelieve the existence of Elena. She was now speaking as though Mavis and Elena had long been paramount issues in her life. He found it impossible to collect and analyze the doubts and suspicions that whirled through his head. He understood only that Mavis Travers stood in some close relation to Sir Julian Travers, toward whose deathbed they were hastening, and that Lady Ursula knew, and had long known, and was somehow connected with them both. The taxicab was winding now among the slums of the East End, mean houses, mean streets, swarming with children and noisy with the balls of the costermongers. A strange setting, mused Mr. Clavering, for the last scene in the life of Sir Julian Travers, scion of an ancient family. He noticed that a second cab appeared to be following theirs through the devious mazes of the East End, and he wondered if it could possibly contain Burton. The taxicab stopped finally before a block of lodging house buildings, where was a beer shop at the corner, bolstered up by a group of rough-looking men. Lady Ursula hurriedly alighted, and with white face and lips set tight, followed Mercedes Quero into the grimy house, stale with the reek of cooking food. Mr. Clavering, hastening after, stumbled over a couple of exceedingly dirty children playing in the doorway, and felt his whole being revolt at the ill-odorous surroundings he was again forced into. Mercedes Quero pushed up the stairs through more children, and a knot of tousled, unkempt women, gaping at the elegant lady in mourning who followed, and led the way into a wretched, disordered room. On the bed a man lay tossing restlessly and muttering. 
The district nurse, a middle-aged woman with a sad, motherly face, came from the bedside and spoke to the detective. "'Dr. Blair has just gone. He can't do nothing more. It is only a question of minutes.' With a wondering and pitying look at Lady Ursula, who was steadying herself against the door, the nurse went softly from the room. Mr. Clavering plucked Lady Ursula by the sleeve. "'I I don't think I would go in,' he said nervously. "'This is hardly the place for you.' "'Why not?' bitterly. "'Have you not guessed what Julian Travers is to me? He is my husband.' "'Your husband?' he echoed blankly. "'My husband,' she repeated without emotion. "'Should you not say my place was with him?' At the sound of her voice, the dying man hurled himself up from the bed. "'Ursula, you came! I didn't think you would!' Lady Ursula's bitterness melted at the sight of the pitiful wreck before her. She went over to the bed, and slipping an arm about Travers' thin shoulders, eased him down upon the pillow. "'I am sorry, Julian.' The glazing eyes stared up at her resentfully. "'No, you're not. Why can't you be honest? This is a lucky release for you. For years I have been a millstone around your neck. You told me so yourself.' "'I am sorry,' Lady Ursula repeated, smoothing back the damp black hair. "'Very sorry for you, for us both.' There was a world of compassion in her tone. With his little remaining strength, Travers pushed her away. "'Cut that rot!' he bade, in his hard, gasping voice. "'I haven't lived like a saint, and I'm not going to die like one. I didn't send for you to hear a deathbed repentance, or to preach one. Hang me if I know why I did send for you. You've no love for me, and God knows you've no reason to have. You won't water my grave with your tears, and I don't ask you to. Meldrum will console you.' The leer on the face of the dying man was ghastly. Lady Ursula turned away that she might not see it. When Travers spoke again, it was with greater difficulty, but his old bitter bravado stood by him on the very threshold of death. "'I shan't lay any injunctions on my sorrowing widow, but there's something I'll ask you. Mavis, she's a rum little filly. I like her. Don't let her know much about me. There's no need.' They were his last words. Lady Ursula fell on her knees by the bedside, sobbing. Mercedes Quero stepped softly to the door and beckoned to someone down the hall. A moment later, a big blonde man came quietly in. "'Ursula,' said the kind voice of Meldrum. She rose from her knees in slow wonder. "'Ursula,' went on the kind voice. "'Let me take you home. He is at rest now.' Meldrum passed his arm about her, and she clung to him, sobbing as though the pent-up anguish of years had at last found vent. "'Ah, Wilford, the pity of that wasted life!' "'He is at rest,' Meldrum repeated with infinite compassion, and gently drew her from the room. End of chapter 24《Chapter Twenty Five of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Clavering Learns More of Detective Methods. While Lady Ursula was making arrangements for the removal of Travers' body, Mr. Clavering and Mercedes Quero waited outside in the cab, and he ventured to ask her how she had come to suspect the identity of Thompson, the butler. "'From the first I was interested in the servant's description of him,' she answered. "'But I had difficulty in making them talk. Lady Ursula had commanded them to preserve silence in regard to him. Still, we detectives have a persuasive way when necessary, and I learned that he had apparently forced himself into the household. Lady Ursula had sent to London for a butler, then suddenly wired the man not to come, and the next morning presented Thompson as the butler. No one knew where he had come from, he was palpably ignorant of the duties of a butler, behaved in an arrogant manner to the servants, was insolent to Lady Ursula, and openly contemptuous of Lord Portstead's orders. None of the servants had a good word to say for him, but her ladyship's silly little maid was said to have been infatuated with him. "'It did not occur to me to question the servants in regard to—to to Thompson,' said Mr. Clavering, chagrined at his failure to do so, and evidently believing that he could have persuaded the servants to talk as well as could the detective. 
In fact, I did not see how Thompson could have had any connection with the case, since he left the manor some hours before the necklace arrived. But he did not leave the village, Mr. Clavering. That afternoon he was drinking at the Portstead Arms. Rose joined him there later, and evidently brought the stolen necklace. It seems to have been no secret that Lady Pevensey had sent for it, and he must have planned the details of its theft before he left the manor, as the result of a violent quarrel with Lady Ursula. But, demurred Mr. Clavering, I cannot understand why he should return the necklace, nor how it was returned. Mercedes Quero shot a glance at Mr. Clavering from her luminous brown eyes, expressive of her wonder at his slowness of comprehension. That explains itself. Lady Ursula suspected that he had stolen the necklace, and on the night of its theft she sent Lord Meldrum, ah, you begin to understand, to his hiding place in the woods to beg him to give up the necklace. Travers had occupied the woodcutter's hut before he played at being butler. He knew that the police were trailing him. He evidently offered to restore the necklace on payment of money, for Lord Meldrum went to him again on the next night, directly after his interview in the library with the Earl, and I am convinced that he carried with him the money from the Portstead rents which Lady Ursula had that morning received. You will recollect that only three days later she was without money, and was forced to appeal to you to satisfy her younger brother's creditors. Moreover, I discovered that Lord Meldrum had instructed his bankers to transfer from his account to Lady Ursula's, without her knowledge, a sum exactly equivalent to the revenue from the Portstead rents. There you have the explanation of Lord Meldrum's suspicious actions. Lady Ursula, of course, could not return the necklace openly without entering into explanations. This she was unwilling to do, and so, apparently, at her wit's end, she came through the secret passage into your chamber and replaced the necklace in the dressing-table drawer, hoping that it would soon be discovered. The detective's tone bore the ring of conviction, but Mr. Clavering was still a little puzzled. Lord Meldrum knew, then, that Thompson was Travers, Lady Ursula's husband? He may have suspected, but I think, I feel sure, that he did not know the whole truth until his interview with the Earl. I believe that Lord Portstead summoned him to the library in order to tell him that Lady Ursula was Travers' wife. Of course he did, agreed Mr. Clavering, viewing the detective with unbounded admiration. But I cannot yet see how you came to discover Lady Ursula's marriage and Travers' identity. Mercedes Quero gave a superior little smile. Incidentally, I first discovered Mavis, before you even knew of her existence. I made a shrewd guess as to whose child she was, and the more I observed Lady Ursula, the more convinced I became. I knew that Thompson had some hold over her, and granting that there was a union between them, regular or even irregular, the Earl's excessive opposition to Lord Meldrum's attentions to her was comprehensible. But I admit it was the will which really showed me the truth. There was given Mavis's surname, which I had not been able to learn, and her former place of residence, if not birth. I wired an Italian detective to search the marriage and birth registers in the vicinity of Tegiano, and he found records of the marriage of Lady Ursula to Sir Julian Travers, and of the birth of their daughter Mavis. I next sent to Scotland Yard for a personal description of Travers. I knew him well enough by reputation, as I fancy every tracker of criminals does. The description tallied with that of the supposed butler, and I was also told that Travers had been seen recently in England. The police had been on his track, and then he suddenly dropped out of sight. Of course you will understand that during the period of his disappearance he was in the vicinity of the manor harrying Lady Ursula for money, and attempting to gain possession of Mavis, for he knew that if he had the child his hold on Lady Ursula would be strengthened. Lady Ursula very unwisely removed Mavis from the north wing of the manor to Wild Rose Villa, but it was hard to keep the child secreted in the north wing. Before the house party she had had the run of the manor, and of course could not understand why she must be locked up now. Elena was a strict jailer, but occasionally Mavis would escape her vigilance and go roaming about the house. One night, as you know, she fell downstairs. She bruised herself rather badly, and Elena, to prevent any further roamings, broke her little crutch and hid it in the truckle bed where Burton found it. Her crutch? echoed Mr. Clavering in astonishment. Mercedes Quero looked astonished in her turn. Didn't you know that Mavis was a cripple? 
why no i only saw her twice once in the dog cart and the second time sitting in the window at wild rose villa i wonder that eleanor allowed her to be seen there so often remarked the detective when she knew that travers was trying to get possession of her but i suppose she had confidence in her own ability to protect the child she certainly showed herself an excellent marksman two nights ago when he tried to break into the villa he was so maimed by the shot that he could do no more than drag himself into that tangle of bushes behind the shed while he lay hidden there elena harnessed tony and with the child drove to the manor i am fortunately a light sleeper and i heard them drive up as elena is provided with the key to the library door lady ursula trusts her implicitly and the woman is devoted to her they did not have to rouse the servants at sunrise the next morning lady ursula drove them over to the railway station at west haven where they caught the early train for london she evidently considered belgrave square a safer residence for mavis now than portstead village she could not foresee that travers would go up to london on the very next train he was driven to the station by the village ne'er-do-well who had brought him food while he was living in the woods and was waiting down the lane with a wagon when he tried to break into the villa mr clavering looked very grave travers led a bad life from the time he was expelled from eton i often wondered at the fascination he exercised over lady ursula he was several years older than she and steeped in vice while she was still a schoolgirl her father did his best to break off the attachment but opposition served only to increase her infatuation and at the time of his public disgrace she was brought into unpleasant prominence from then until her father died she lived abroad he never forgave her for bringing the old name into such painful notoriety he was a very proud man so evidently was his heir commented mercedes quero dryly proud and cold and hard he did his duty by his sister and her child as far as maintaining them went but it was with the stipulation as the clause in his will shows that lady ursula keep her marriage a strict secret and he exacted payment for what he considered his magnanimity by forcing her to live under a system of constant espionage and merciless criticism she must have lived in continual torture hounded for money by a husband she was ashamed and forbidden to own obliged to hide her child from the world and subjected daily to the petty tyranny of a man who would never permit her to forget his sublimity and her own abasement i wonder that she endured so long she must indeed have led a wretched life agreed mr clavering i do not wish to speak ill of the dead but lord portstead had an exaggerated idea of his own righteousness and travers was a man of unspeakable degradation yet it is hard to think of him as being the murderer of his wife's brother as a matter of fact he was not remarked mercedes quero quietly mr clavering gaped in amazement but but i thought why everything points to him on the contrary replied the detective with her enigmatic smile i have indisputable proof that at the time the murder was committed travers was in west haven gambling away the money that lady ursula had paid him for the necklace mr clavering fairly bounced up from his seat then who mercedes quero sat straight and determined and her eyes burned into his as she said i hope to make the guilty person speak before this day is over until the truth is declared suspicion will hang over those who are innocent and while there may be extenuating circumstances the guilty person must not be spared at the expense of others yet although i am morally certain who committed the murder i have no actual proof and unless i can force a confession i must admit myself beaten in the case as burton has been obliged to do mr clavering sank back with the old nameless dread in his heart what did she mean by extenuating circumstances who could have killed portstead under extenuating circumstances who but he voiced the question but mercedes quero had slipped on the mask of reserve and she would say only i will not accuse where i have no proof you must wait developments just then lady ursula and lord meldrum emerged from the lodging-house meldrum courteously but firmly made a way for her through the gaping crowd blocking the steps and sidewalk and assisted her into the cab he gave the direction belgrave square and the car with a warning honk shot forward lady ursula kept her veil down and now and then she caught her breath with a shuddering sigh meldrum appeared deeply moved at a stifled sob from lady ursula his fine face contracted 
and he laid his hand on hers in silent sympathy. Arrived at the mansion in Belgrave Square, he led her up the steps with tender solicitude. At the opening of the door, there sounded a brisk tap, tapping along the hall. In the shadow of the tall footman, Mr. Clavering caught sight of a little red-haired, sharp-featured girl balancing herself on a tiny crutch and peering curiously at the newcomers. Lady Ursula, throwing back her veil, went quickly toward the child, and stooping, gathered her in her arms and kissed her. The child suffered the embrace, but soon freed herself. "'I know that man!' she cried gleefully, pointing to Mr. Clavering. Lady Ursula turned to Meldrum. "'Wilford,' she said anxiously, and her cheeks went faintly pink. "'This is Mavis.' Meldrum advanced to the child with hand outstretched. "'I am glad to know Mavis,' he said heartily. Mavis put a thin little hand into his and looked up into the kind face. "'How do you do?' she responded eagerly. "'I am glad to know you, too. I watched you playing bowls one day from the window in the north wing, when Elena was downstairs. I think it's a very interesting game. You always win, don't you? You are so big and strong.' Meldrum's eyes were very kind indeed, as he smiled down at the wisp of a girl, balancing herself on the crutch. "'I have pretty fair luck,' he said gently. "'Sometime you shall watch as many games of bowls as you like.' Mavis clapped her hands and laughed an elfish laugh. Then suddenly she frowned. "'Will she let me?' with a jerk of her head toward Lady Ursula. "'I think she will,' Meldrum responded gravely. End of chapter 25Chapter 26 of That Affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Confession. That evening, Mercedes Quero informed Mr. Clavering that she desired him to be present at a conference she had arranged in the library. I have sent for Robert Sylvester, Lord Portstead, she said, and for the secretary, too. I thought Brooks could take down in shorthand anything of importance that is brought out. Mr. Clavering felt sure that she had had some ulterior purpose in sending for Brooks, and he said so. She gave a low, amused laugh. Really, Mr. Clavering, you are very discerning. You don't like Brooks, do you? Do you? he retaliated. That baffling expression came into her eyes. The late Earl placed confidence in him, she fenced. Ah! as a bell clanged loudly through the house. That must be Lord Portstead and Brooks now. Mr. Clavering, will you kindly ask Lady Ursula to come to the library? Surely you are not going to torture that poor woman with questions now, he expostulated, when she has just come from her husband's deathbed? I must. But there was real regret in the detective's voice. I have been retained by the late Earl's constituents to bring his murderer to justice, and the sooner the suspense is over, the better. After all, as I have no actual proof, I may fail in the experiment I have planned, but I hope to succeed, and I have purposely chosen to-night because Travers' death must be a decided shock to every member of this household, and concealment is not easy when the emotions run high. You are not more sorry for Lady Ursula than I am. I am a woman, and I can appreciate her sufferings. But it would not be right for me to let this matter drift on and continue to involve those who are innocent. Don't you realize that in the eyes of the world there are just three people who had incentive and opportunity for killing the Earl of Portstead? You know who those three are, Mr. Clavering. Lord Meldrum, Robert Sylvester, and Lady Ursula. Not Lady Ursula, he cried the more sharply because of his growing doubts. "'Please call her,' Mercedes Quero said quietly. He found Lady Ursula in the music-room with Robert. The boy was white and agitated. They were talking of Travers, but stopped abruptly as Mr. Clavering entered. Lady Ursula shivered slightly as he gave her Mercedes Quero's message. Robert put his arm about her with a new and manly tenderness. "'See here, Clavering,' he burst out indignantly. I won't have my sister bullied by that detective woman. You go tell her that Lady Ursula doesn't choose to come to the library. Hush, Robin, reproved Lady Ursula gently. We will come directly, Mr. Clavering. He led the way to the library, 
increasing dread in his heart. At the threshold he paused in astonishment. There at the far end of the long room, leaning forward in a big leather chair, sat Mavis, and opposite her Lord Meldrum. Between them was a chessboard, and both were so intent on the game that they did not look up. Mavis's small crutch had slipped to the floor. Her sharp little face was flushed with excitement, and her red hair gleaming in the light of the pendant lamp above her. Meldrum was studying a move. "'I'm going to put your king in check soon,' he laughed as he advanced his knight. Mavis shot out a nervous little finger and played the threatened king to the queen's bishop square. "'You can't, you can't,' she cried with shrill glee. "'I've castled my king.' Meldrum laughed again with easy good humor. "'You little witch, I'll checkmate you yet.' It was then that he glanced up and saw Mr. Clavering, Lady Ursula, and Robert in the doorway. Advancing down the hall were Mercedes Quero and Elena. He colored in some confusion. "'I thought there would be no harm in a few, ah, uh, quiet games,' he said apologetically. "'Mavis wanted to play. We both did, in fact.' Mavis frowned at the intruders. "'Go away,' she said angrily. "'We don't wish to be disturbed. It's your move, Lord Meldrum. Lady Ursula went over to the child. Mavis, dear, she began gently, you must put up the chess pieces and go with Elena. We shall use the library for, for business. Mavis spread her hands protectingly over the chess pieces. Shan't go, she cried defiantly. You never let me do anything I like. You are unkind and cruel. I don't love you. Lady Ursula quivered, but. Go at once with Elena, Mavis, she said with a sternness that reminded one of Portstead. The child shrilled out a second defiance, and Elena advanced toward her with the evident intention of carrying her bodily from the room, when Meldrum interposed. "'You want to play again tomorrow, don't you, Mavis?' She nodded vigorously. "'Well, then, you'll have to let me stop now so I can get through this business here. If it isn't finished tonight, I can't play tomorrow.' Mavis studied his face shrewdly. Slowly she withdrew her hands from the chess pieces and allowed him to sweep them into the box. "'I'll go,' she said at length. "'That's a sensible young woman,' he avowed, with a smile of approval. He picked up the little crutch, helped the child from the chair, and, stooping his tall form, gave her his arm to lead her from the room. Mr. Clavering saw Mercedes Quero's eyes grow misty as they followed the big, boyish man, accommodating his usual stride to the limping steps of this scrap of a girl. At the threshold, Mavis shook hands with her squire in quaint, grown-up fashion, and very politely wished him, "'Good night.' "'Tomorrow I'll capture all your pawns,' she called back from the hall. "'I'll see you do it, young woman,' laughed Meldrum. "'By Jove, she's a shrewd little lass,' he said heartily, turning to Lady Ursula. "'You just saved me from getting badly beaten.' Lady Ursula smiled wanly. "'She has taken a wonderful fancy to you. I never could win her love. I have always been so situated that I was obliged to curb her wishes, and she bitterly resents it.' "'She will learn to love you,' Lord Meldrum responded confidently, adding in a tone meant only for her ear, "'She couldn't help it, you know.' Lady Ursula's face went softly pink, then paled again as Harry Brooks entered the room. He bowed to her with a passionate appeal in his eyes, but she ignored his salutation, and her expression became cold and hostile. The secretary showed anger at her rebuff, and glowered at Lord Meldrum with all his former vindictiveness. Mercedes Quero stepped quietly to the door and closed it when Elena would have left the room. "'This will be a very trying hour for Lady Ursula,' she remarked. "'I think that you had best remain.' Robert surveyed the detective with indignation, and Elena viewed her savagely. Of a sudden she caught Lady Ursula's hand and kissed it passionately, murmuring endearments in Italian. Lady Ursula smiled at her reassuringly. "'I am very well, Elena Mia,' she said affectionately. "'You must not worry about me.' At this juncture Mercedes Quero placed a chair for herself near the centre of the library, and her action caused at once a tense silence to fall upon the room. Elena took her stand near Lady Ursula, her great black eyes devouring her mistress's white face. "'I have asked you all to come here,' 
Mercedes Quero began in a low, though clear and thrilling voice, because I am going to tell you now, as the result of my investigations, the truth about the theft of the government papers and the death of the late Earl of Portstead. She paused, perhaps naturally, perhaps for effect, and looked about her. Lady Ursula had steeled herself to composure, and there was a marble-like rigidity to her features. Lord Meldrum, standing over her chair, showed only solicitude for her, but in the faces of Robert and the secretary was undisguised fear. Elena still looked as though she could annihilate the girlish, grey-clad figure on which every gaze was bent. Mr. Clavering, standing constrainedly by the tall mahogany bookcases, felt a sense of relief when the detective spoke again. "'I am able,' she resumed, slightly raising her voice, to detail with a sufficient degree of accuracy the movements of every member of the household at Portstead Manor between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. on the night of the Earl's death. Lord Meldrum went to his appointment in the library at 10, and he remained there until 11.30. There was an unseen listener at this interview. Mr. Harry Brooks was concealed in the small book-room leading off the library and separated from it only by a curtain of old tapestry, as you all know. Now don't trouble to deny it, Mr. Brooks, as he was about to make a vehement protest, or to suggest that you could not have entered the room without the Earl having seen you. Along the wainscoting on the left wall of the long gallery, which leads through the main part of the manor, is a sliding panel giving admittance into this book-room. It was through this panel that you entered. The secretary's whole little frame was a quiver, but he struggled to control himself. "'There may or may not be such a panel,' he said thickly, "'but you can't prove that I used it, or even knew of its existence.' "'Pardon me, Mr. Brooks,' interposed the detective smoothly. "'You left a tell-tale behind you that night.' Apparently unconscious of his threatening glances, she opened her silver mesh bag with elaborate precision and drew forth a small bit of dark tweed cloth. "'I found this caught tightly in the sliding panel, Mr. Brooks. You recognize it?' The little secretary looked capable of any violence now. "'I do not recognize it,' he asserted surly. "'Strange that you should not,' murmured Mercedes Quero, stroking the cloth with her slender fingers. "'Your discarded house-jacket is of this material, and there is a piece torn from it which exactly corresponds to this interesting little sample.' Just there Brooks lost complete control of himself. "'That's a lie!' he shouted, and would have bounded at the detective, had not Lord Meldrum seized him by the collar and flung him back against the wall. "'Be careful, you little beast!' he warned. Brooks leaned a moment against the wall, cringing under Meldrum's stern eyes. Then he straightened up with sullen defiance and addressed the detective, who sat regarding him with a smile of contempt. "'You will never prove that I killed the Earl of Portstead,' he challenged. "'I haven't accused you yet, Mr. Brooks,' she reminded him quietly. "'But if I were you, I should not suggest that idea to others.' "'What are you trying to insinuate against me?' he demanded hotly. "'I am making a charge against you of theft,' she answered steadily. "'Theft of government papers, on which your employer was working when Lord Meldrum came to the library.' The secretary burst into a violent denial, but she cut him short. "'When Lord Meldrum left the library by the garden door,' she resumed with perfect confidence, "'the Earl went up the circular stairs to summon his sister down. "'Am I right, Lady Ursula?' Her ladyship was gazing at the detective with eyes of wonder and fear. "'Yes,' she admitted in a scarcely audible voice. "'In that short period of the Earl's absence,' pursued Mercedes Quero, with a little air of pardonable pride, "'you, Mr. Brooks,' came out from the book-room and stole those papers, because you hoped that suspicion would thereby be thrown on Lord Meldrum, which was exactly what did happen. When the Earl returned and found the papers gone, he no doubt concluded that Lord Meldrum, being the person most interested in their suppression, was the thief. It was easier for him to believe this since he found the garden door open, as though Lord Meldrum had returned and hastily gone out again. Really, Mr. Brooks, that was a clever thought of yours, opening the outer door. The secretary was getting himself in hand now. "'That is a very pretty little theory of yours,' he returned with a show of scorn. "'But what about the motive? Why should it matter to me whether Lord Meldrum were considered a thief?' "'Because,' she said directly, "'you wish to discredit him in the opinion of Lady Ursula.' 
i think i need not dwell upon the absurd hopes your presumption led you to cherish lady ursula evinced no surprise but the scorn in her eyes grew the secretary's features convulsed with rage he went precipitately to the door i wouldn't be in a hurry to leave the room mr brooks cautioned the smooth even voice of the detective there is a police inspector in the hall waiting to serve a warrant which i have sworn out against you knowing this you may prefer to hear the end of my theories brooks threw himself into a chair by the door and contented himself by scowling at the cool young woman to come back now to what happened after mr brooks so cleverly stole the papers she continued with a satirical smile in his direction the earl naturally communicated to lady ursula his suspicions of lord meldrum and i think i am safe in assuming that her ladyship refused to believe in his guilt the rigidity of lady ursula's features relaxed and she smiled up into meldrum's grave face lady ursula returned to her room pursued the detective and the earl remained in the library waiting until lord meldrum should come back the earl knew that he had gone on a mission for her ladyship a sharply drawn breath from lady ursula and a sudden tightening of meldrum's lips showed that the detective's surmise if it were no more was correct at about one forty five she continued lady ursula unable to endure longer the suspense of lord meldrum's absence he had gone on such missions before and returned much sooner determined to go in search of him the earl had extinguished the lights in the library and she supposed that he had gone to bed and that she could leave the house without detection lady ursula suddenly flashing a glance in her direction you will set me right if i overstep the truth in my deductions lady ursula sat in stony silence and the detective resuming her story said her ladyship's way would lead her into the woods and she dared not go there at that hour without a weapon of some sort so she procured her younger brother's pistol robert seemed about to cry out in indignation but managed to control himself elena moved nearer her mistress mr clavering was sure that no bit of by-play was lost on mercedes quero her great brown eyes darker now and more brilliant than he had ever seen them before flashed from one tense face to the other and her ivory pale cheeks glowed feverishly it must have taken will-power to keep her voice low and even as it was as lady ursula descended the circular stairs she was saying she heard the sound of angry voices her brother robert had returned robert dropped his face in his hands and groaned aloud mercedes quero with a pitying glance at the young bowed head went on in the altercation lady ursula took her younger brother's part and drew the earl's anger upon herself suddenly lord meldrum appeared in the garden doorway the earl taxed him with the theft of the papers recriminations followed and lady ursula raised the pistol she held and fired the silence in the room was intense mr clavering was numb with horror robert lifted his face haggard with despair and struggled to speak but no words came then suddenly a terrible cry rang through the room and elena sprang in front of lady ursula who had half risen from her chair you speak lies signorina lies it is not my lady who kill it is i elena the earl he will drive my lady out into the night with so cruel words and i take the pistol from the stair where my lady has drop it and i kill yes and i am glad before the inspector summoned from the hall by her cry could cross the threshold steel flashed in elena's hand and she fell at lady ursula's feet End of chapter 26「twenty seven of that affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Off for the Continent. Months had passed, and Mr. Clavering was lunching at Claridge's with Mercedes Quero. He had formed a kind of Boswell Johnson friendship with the young detective, whose fame had been enhanced by the Portstead Manor case. She still sometimes yielded to the temptation of making merry at his expense but on the whole as she appreciated his sterling qualities she was kind to him and when in a particularly gracious mood would listen to the laborious theories he propounded apropos the cases she was engaged upon born and bred a gentlewoman 
a sudden turn of fortune had thrown her upon her own resources and as her life since had been lonely her profession precluding her from former friendships she was probably grateful for the honest admiration of this very estimable gentleman a quiet little wedding which mr clavering had attended in belgrave square that morning had brought to the minds of both the tragedy at portstead manor and mr clavering again expressed his wonderment at the detective's cleverness in discovering the guilty person why it was all so simple she deprecated lightly that i am surprised that even burton failed to guess the truth i always work through the process of elimination and it was particularly successful in this case i studied singly the three suspects lord meldrum robert sylvester and lady ursula all of whom had equal motive and opportunity it was clear from the first that lady ursula suspected lord meldrum and so i at once eliminated her for of course her suspicion proved her innocence then when robert sylvester appeared i soon discovered by the same reasoning that he too was innocent he suspected his sister there remained then lord meldrum and his innocence was equally clear he suspected robert but was generous enough to let suspicion rest on himself in order to save the boy for lady ursula's sake after i had eliminated these three i endeavoured to reconstruct in my mind the scene that took place in the library at two a m from my investigations as i have said i knew pretty accurately the whereabouts of every member of the household at that hour i took especial pains to inquire about harry brooks but i learned from two of the servants who had been kept awake by him that he had spent the hours from midnight until the shot occurred pacing his room unceasingly i next considered the possibility of elena's guilt i knew that she was of a violent nature and it was likely that her intense devotion to lady ursula would make her bitter and resentful toward the earl no one could know better than she the bondage under which he held his sister the more i studied elena the more convinced i became of her guilt but granting that she had motive how was i to prove her presence in the library at two o'clock i began by questioning elsie baring i had always felt that she was withholding information and that her importance as a witness had been very much disregarded i was more successful than i had expected when i made her realize that i was not trying to incriminate robert i found her surprisingly communicative as her room was next to lady ursula's she had been awakened by the earl when he came to call his sister into the library from the tone of his voice she knew that he was in an unpleasant humor fearing that robert was the cause she became so nervous and worried that she was unable to sleep she heard lady ursula return to her room and for over an hour sob and moan miss baring was about to go to her when she heard her unlock her door and hurry down the corridor anxiety prompted miss baring to follow her and she saw her go into robert's room come out immediately with something in her hand which she suspected was robert's pistol and then go up the stairs into the north wing you see mr clavering lady ursula knew well where her brother kept his pistol she was in the habit of lending it to lord meldrum when he went on his night missions for her he did not possess one of his own until the day after the murder when he sent up to london for it so he told the truth at the inquest when he stated that robert's pistol had been in his possession though of course his refusal to answer whether it had been in his possession on the night in question was intended to divert suspicion from robert to himself to come back now to miss baring after she saw lady ursula vanish into the north wing she became so fearful of what might happen that she lingered about the stairs expecting some tragedy and yet not daring to follow lady ursula further it was from the hall window that she beheld robert sylvester return to the manor lady ursula remained in the north wing about a quarter of an hour and then she came down accompanied by elena whose existence miss baring had never before suspected neither lady ursula nor elena noticed miss baring who was hiding behind the tapestry which lines the walls of the corridor and they hurried down the circular stairs into the library miss baring crept after them and from the head of the stairs heard the voices of robert and the earl robert was in a passion then she heard lady ursula pleading for robert and the earl sarcastically and cruelly upbraided her miss baring crept far enough down the stairs to see that the library was in darkness and that a man was entering by the garden doorway whom she recognized by his voice when the earl taxed him with the theft of the government papers 
as Lord Meldrum. Of what happened next she had only a confused notion. There were bitter recriminations, and suddenly a shot rang out. She had no idea who fired it, and remembered only rushing up to her own room and locking herself in. But she suspected either Robert or Lord Meldrum, for she believed that Lady Ursula had given the pistol to one or the other. I made a diagram of the library, and the probable positions of those present at the time of the shot, in order to understand how it was possible for three people to suspect one another. I decided that the Earl was standing in the centre of the room, Lady Ursula at the foot of the circular stairs, Robert between her and the Earl, and Lord Meldrum by the garden doorway, since Robert knew that the shot came from the circular stairs, and it did not occur to him to suspect Lord Meldrum. Lady Ursula was too overwrought to have any idea of the direction whence the shot came, and I doubt if she could even have told where Lord Meldrum was standing. But as she had been in the habit of going down the circular stairs to give the pistol to him, I believe that in her terror and bewilderment she thought she had done so this night. Such cases of mental suggestion through terror are not uncommon, and Lord Meldrum subsequently said nothing to disprove her belief. Miss Baring has stated that Elena remained standing on one of the spirals of the staircase, and I believe that no one in the library, save Lady Ursula, knew of her presence. In the confusion following the shot, she must have escaped into the north wing unnoticed. Robert, in his horror at what he believed his sister's act, fled from the manor, and Lord Meldrum went in pursuit of him. But he soon turned back, probably to stand by Lady Ursula, or possibly he had some half-formed idea of shouldering for her sake what he believed to be Robert's responsibility. He could not have known then that the shot was fatal. You will remember his exclamation when he came into the library and saw the Earl stretched upon the floor. My God, he is dead! In the meantime Lady Ursula, obeying mad impulse, had rushed from the library, locking the door after her, and fled into the front of the manor. Elena must have come down later, after the coroner had gone, and hidden the pistol behind the cushion of the chair where I found it. Now, Mr. Clavering, I think I have explained everything as far as I can. It was a deplorable tragedy, said he with a deep sigh, but at least it has made a man of Robert Sylvester, and I believe he will do well in the government secretaryship Lord Meldrum has procured for him. I believe he will, assented Mercedes Quero. And now, Mr. Clavering, consulting her tiny silver watch, if you intend to reach Charing Cross in time to see Lord Meldrum and Lady Ursula off for the continent, you must call a taxicab, and at once a hansom will never get you there. Mr. Clavering rose in a flurry. Will you not see them off, too? She shook her head. No, my presence would only bring back unpleasant memories to Lady Ursula. But they have my best wishes for a very happy tour. They are to be gone two years, I think you said? Two years, responded Mr. Clavering gloomily. He would miss Meldrum at the clubs. He shook hands gravely with the detective, apologized for leaving her so abruptly, arranged for another little lunch in the near future, and stepping into a taxicab, much as he disliked them, was soon whirled to Charing Cross. As he flurriedly made his way through the great station to the Continental train, he beheld Lady Ursula, tall and elegant in her dark travelling suit, the centre of a little group composed of Robert, Elsie Baring, and Lady Pevensey. The latter was kissing her effusively. At the window of a first-class compartment he saw the red hair and elfish face of Mavis. The child was greedily nibbling chocolates and beaming down at Lord Meldrum, who was talking to her from the platform. Meldrum turned as Mr. Clavering approached. "'By George, old chap!' he cried jovially. "'I thought you were going to be late for the first time in your life.' Lady Ursula detached herself from the little group and came toward Mr. Clavering with hand outstretched. "'Wilford doesn't tell you,' she smiled, "'that he almost made us late because he would stop to buy Mavis more candies. He is spoiling the child and ruining her digestion.' Meldrum laughed boyishly. "'Oh, I'll do better in a few days, Ursula. You'll have to make allowances for a while. I'm so awfully happy, you know.' She smiled into his glowing face. "'So am I awfully happy, Wilford,' and her slim gloved hand sought his a moment. Just then the guards blew their whistles. Robert threw his arms about Lady Ursula and gave her several loud, boyish kisses. "'Good-bye, and best happiness, you dearest of sisters!' Lady Ursula clung to him fondly. 
don't forget robin that you and elsie have promised to spend part of your honeymoon with us that we won't he answered with a choke in his voice as he helped her aboard the train then he turned and wrung lord meldrum's hand good-bye mel old chap keep ursula smiling mr clavering was beginning to feel strangely downhearted when lord meldrum caught his hand in a warm grip that crushed two years is a long time away from old england and old friends he said in a husky voice you'll not fail to join us in germany at christmas eh clavering dear boy the carriage doors were slamming lord meldrum sprang aboard and mr clavering with a sudden tightening of the throat stood gazing after the departing train and the blonde head leaning from the window lady pevensey touched him on the arm come back to my flat archibald she said with a little sniff we'll have tea and play piquet End of chapter 27 End of that affair at Portstead Manor by Gladys Edson Locke